Welcome, Dr. Epic here. And in this lecture, we're gonna learn about the jigsaw killer. We're gonna learn about biological identity. We're gonna learn about the insult that can be done to bone. We're gonna do a series of little forensic exercises ourselves. And we're gonna learn at least one reason why you really shouldn't do hard drugs. We're gonna follow that outline right up above my little yellow box as we study, as we are introduced to forensic anthropology. And along the way, we're gonna meet a number of interesting characters, up to and including poor Isabella Ruxton herself. So we're gonna start by defining what forensic anthropology actually is. So, uh, defined, at least in terms of this course, Forensic anthropology is the use of physical anthropology in a legal or quasi-legal setting. And as such, it is concerned with four main goals. One, the identification of unknown human remains. And this is done using a biological identity, which is something we'll talk about in, in just a tick. Two, determining the time and means of death. Three, determining how much time has passed between death and the discovery of the set of human remains. And four, the ability to give legal testimony uh, about all of the above, about all of those three things. But forensic anthropology is more than that. It's, it's more than just, you know, legally giving testimony about a set of human remains. Forensic anthropology is really about what we can learn from the end of human life, what we can learn about death. What happened around death, what happened just before the end of life, the life history of the person leading up to the moment of their death, what happened to them after they died, and what we can learn from a set of human remains as it ends up in a forensics laboratory. Now, I've done quite a bit of forensic anthropology along these lines. I, I did a touch of the, the more traditional forensic stuff at LSU and at, at San Diego State, uh, but I've, I've excavated a large number of human remains, probably too many. Uh, so I've gotten quite good at, at being able to study human remains in the field. So I have a lot of firsthand experience dealing with this, even though, to be honest, the vast majority of the people I've dealt with died like a really long time ago. But before we really get into physical anthropology, I'm going to start with a warning. We are going to look at some pretty grisly images. We're going to look at human bodies. We're going to look at human bodies that have been subjected to a great deal of violence. We're going to look at what animals do when they come into contact with an undiscovered set of human remains. So consider yourself warned. We're going to approach this topic in a pretty scientific and educational manner. We're going to take a pretty detached perspective, but we are going to look at human remains. And we should remember that these were people at one point in time, and they deserve all of the dignity and respect we can afford them. But we are still going to study them scientifically because we can learn about the end of human life as we study these individuals. So we are going to look at some grisly stuff. Brace yourself and make sure you are in the proper mental space to do so. And we're going to start by looking at a series of very grisly photographs, the victims of the Jigsaw Killer. And there they are. The Jigsaw Killer comes out of the Ruxton case, a very famous forensic case. And this, was, this case was 1935 to 1936. And it starts in September of 1935. And outside a, a town in Scotland called Moffat, they found in a series of ravines and creeks scattered human remains. And there they are. Dubbed the victims of the Jigsaw Killer, uh, the remains were badly disarticulated. They were badly decomposed. Many of the distinguishing features had been removed. The fingertips were gone to remove fingerprints. The teeth were removed to prevent dental identification. The faces were removed to, pre to prevent visual identification. Someone knew what they were doing when they attempted to hide these bodies and conceal the identity of their victims. Somebody who knew how to identify a body. Now, the doctors were able to study and sort of configure the different parts of these individuals, the parts that could be found. Not all of them were found. And they were able to determine that they were looking at the pelvises, they were looking at the structure of the skulls, that these are a pair of middle-aged females. And uh, uh, wrapped around one of the body parts was a newspaper uh, from Lancaster, from the city of Lancaster in England. 
And in fact, there were a pair of w women missing from the city of Lancaster. Uh, Mrs. Ila Isabella Roxton and her housemaid, Mary uh, Jane Rogerson. And to prove their identity, what they did was they were able to take photographs of Isabella Ruxton and of Mary Rogerson and kind of ghost photographs of the skulls behind these older photographs of the women that were taken when they were alive. This is one of the first uses of forensic science to identify individuals and to catch the person who murdered them, the, the, the jigsaw killer. So as you can see from that photograph on the upper left, they looked at the angle of uh, a photograph of Isabella Ruxton that was taken when she was alive. And then they took a picture of the skull at, from the same angle. Then they superimposed the two images, one on top of the other, in order to check that all of the features of the skull match all of the physical features of Isabella Ruxton. In other words, through forensic science, through the, the use of this sort of ghost photography, they were able to prove that the two body, the collection of body parts found in Scotland matched Isabella Ruxton and Mary Rogerson. And immediately they zeroed in on the suspicious activities of Isabella Ruxton's husband, Buck Ruxton, Dr. Ruxton, a, a physician who was familiar with the ways in which scientists and detectives can identify human remains. They searched the house of Buck Ruxton, there he is, and found incriminating evidence, found the bathtub, which still had traces of blood where he had dismembered uh, the two women's bodies. He had, been, he had been obsessed that his wife was cheating on him. He had flown into a jealous rage, murdered her, and while taking care of her body, the housemaid came in, so he murders the housemaid, and then in an attempt to conceal their identities, removes all of the distinguishing features that he know exists, cuts up the bodies in his bathtub, goes to Scotland and attempts to scatter them, hoping that they'll never be found, or if they were found, they could never uh, be identified. But what Buck Ruxton didn't know is that the forensic anthropology of the time had advanced beyond his own knowledge, and the forensics, even of the 1930s, were good enough to identify the women, trace them back to the house they were missing from, and help convict Buck Ruxton. Uh, he was hung, I believe, in 1936. What they did with the Ruxton case was able to establish, able to, to look at a set of human remains, identify a series of traits, those individuals' biological identities, and then use what they know about those biological identities to connect it to the known attributes of Isabella Ruxton because every individual has a unique biological identity. Now, a biological identity, and, and there's the definition right over there, biological identity is the unique combination of physical traits that every single individual human being on this planet possesses. Your individual traits are completely and utterly unique to you. And the uniqueness of your biological identity extends down into your skeletal architecture. Uh, and osteologically, uh, a really good forensic scientist can look at a set of disarticulated human remains and piece together aspects of a biological identity. Is this a male or a female? The age, the ancestry, any other distinguishing traits? And build a portrait of the set of physical remains and then match it with known missing persons. And, and forensic anthropologists do this all the time. Sometimes they are very successful, as in the case of Isabella Ruxton. Other times they are not so successful. So let's look at the attributes of an individual's biological identity. And there it is over there on the left. First, you have biological sex, which we've already talked about in a previous lecture. As we have talked about ancestry, you know, what continent uh, you have, your ancestral traits uh, are most commonly found in. Secondly, thirdly, there is age, which we'll talk about in just a second. And then there is stature, like basically just how tall you are. And then there is any other distinguishing marks and or skeletal abnormalities as well as your surgical history. And the surgical history extends to the teeth themselves. And let's just look at my biological identity for just a second. Uh, biologically male, ancestry of European ancestry, 
age, <laughs> embarrassingly middle. Uh, the stature is of about 5'9", 5'10", on a good day. Distinguishing marks and or skeletal abnormalities. I've been in about seven motorcycle crashes, and my I have the skeletal damage to prove it. Uh, both my wrists as well as my legs have numerous knots and swirls and hairline fractures all over them. I mean, you can you can feel along the top of my tibia. It feels like a piece of old oak. It's so knotted and worn. Uh, and surgical history. Uh, the only surgical history I've really had is pretty extensive dental reconstruction. And this can all be used to identify me, even if I looked like that. A, a set of scattered, unknown uh, human remains, uh, disarticulated and scattered across the forest floor. Now let's talk about age. How could my age actually be determined from a set of scattered human remains? Uh, and basically, age can best be determined through uh, dental records. That basically, your teeth erupt at a very set pattern, all right? Sometimes people can be a little bit older, sometimes they're a little bit younger, but in most cases, your teeth are a very good indicator of your age. And if you look at that pattern of teeth right up above me, uh, you can see that each set of permanent teeth come in at a pretty narrow range, and you can pretty much narrow down exactly how old someone is based on their the, the pattern of dental eruption. You know, when your first premolar comes in, when your canines come in. And what I want you to do is look at that chart right above me and try to determine what age your skeleton is just based on the teeth in your head. And again, uh, if you are going, if you are in the middle of the eruption of your permanent teeth, uh, the date, your age can be uh, quite uh, accurately pinpointed. Uh, but if all of your permanent teeth have come in, then the age range is start to get a little larger. But it's not just the uh, dental eruption that in, by which you can, you can determine the age of an individual when they passed away. You can also do so through uh, epiphyseal union. Again, when we're born, we're born with more bones. And as we age, our bones actually fuse together. And they fuse together at a fairly set rate. And again, lifestyle factors can change this. Heavier individuals tend to have somewhat older bones. Lighter, more fit individuals tend to have somewhat younger bones. Uh, and you can study this uh, as your as different bones in your body fuse together. And the most common bones that do fuse together are the ends of your long bones. For instance, you can see that photograph in the upper left, that illustration on the upper left, uh, that you actually have the epiphyses of a femur are separate uh, when you're born and they join together and they eventually fuse into a single bone. So where before you had, say, four or five bones making up your entire femur, by the time you reach adulthood, that is fused into a single, solid, strong bone. And if you look right up above me, this union of your femoral bones pretty much takes place around the age of age 17. So if a scientist finds a set of disarticulated human remains, and there is a single large femur present, even in this scattered set of human remains, you know that the individual has to be older than 17. So if I was a, a set of scattered, disarticulated human remains on the forest floor, they'd look at my femur and go, that person is at least more than 17 years old. Of course, I'm a lot older than 17, uh, but it is absolutely true. And you can see that as we uh, reach full physical maturity, the pattern of epiphyseal union can quite accurately track our age. Now, there's other factors, not just dental eruption or epiphyseal union. There's also uh, the fusing of the sutures of the cranium, which occurs basically in middle age and in advanced age as well, that the, the, the suture lines along your skull actually start to blend and they start to vanish when you begin to reach middle age uh, and higher. So you can predict the age of an individual at death based on uh, the markers of their skeletal architecture. Now, let's get to insult to bone. Uh, it's also called trauma, and this is when the bones of the human body, something goes wrong with them, and they have to be repaired. And trauma is, of course, any significant injury, which is also referred to as insult, uh, done to the human body. Uh, there are essentially three kinds of trauma. You have anti-mortem, perimortem, and post-mortem trauma. You can see with that x-ray on the upper left, somebody had a very bad morning uh, in that x-ray. 
that is a, uh, if that individual perished, that's an x-ray of a fresh break. That would be a perimortem injury. Uh, and you can see right up above me, there is another a bone. I believe that's a fibula? Uh, but that's got another radical break. And breaks, when they start to heal, will never exactly heal in exactly the same manner. Which is why anti-mortem trauma can actually be kind of easy to identify. So what is anti-mortem trauma? Anti-mortem trauma is any insult to bone that the individual received over the course of their lives and that has had some degree of healing. So if a bone breaks, the bone will heal back together because bones are living tissues. And this is why it's important to go see a doctor if you've broken a bone. And because if you don't see a doctor, the break will heal at an awkward angle or it'll heal slightly unattached. Or if you're really unfortunate, and break a bone, the bone parts will heal without being attached, creating something known as a, a, a false joint. Um, now, for instance, if you look at that, that uh, distal end of a femur right there, you can see that that is a pretty severe injury, but it's an anti-mortem injury. The edges of the trauma have kind of melted together. The bone, it was in the process of healing uh, when this individual perished. So this individual was hurt quite badly because that's a bad break right there. Um, but you can see that it is not a fresh break. The bone began to heal. It didn't heal all the way. But of course, many things can affect the pattern of healing. I, I wish there was a set schedule by which human bones healed by, but there simply isn't. Uh, fitter, healthier, well-fed individuals will heal quicker. Uh, people who are not getting sufficient nutrition, who aren't in good health, will heal quite slowly. Healed trauma uh, will have no sharp edges to the break. The bone matrix itself will have healed over the injury, giving, giving bone this kind of clay-like or slightly melted look, or this kind of waxy look like you see in the photograph to the left. Generally, the fewer the sharp edges and the softer the edges, the, the greater the degree of healing that has taken place and the longer before death that this injury occurred. You know, this is anti-mortem trauma. Uh, let's look at this individual. Uh, this individual had a very bad day at one point in time. They were struck in the head with an ax. Um, but this, this very bad day was a long time ago because you can see even though this individual was struck in the back of the head with an, with an ax, it didn't kill the person. Uh, if you could think, look at the edges of the insult, uh, it's soft, it looks slightly melted, it looks like a, a waxy candle has kind of flowed over the area. Uh, that the injury, the bone healed. And this, this individual could have been hit in the head with the ax, you know, maybe a couple years before they finally passed away. But yes, that is quite clearly anti-mortem trauma. Here's an individual that had a really, something really interesting happen to them. Uh, this is an image I took from the Bone Clones website, which is an excellent uh, website. It's an excellent catalog. They sell uh, reproductions that are just fantastic. They're scientifically accurate reconstructions. Um, here's an individual who was shot. Uh, I believe that's a 32 caliber bullet. Um, and the individual was shot. The bullet lodged in the bone of their rib. And for whatever reason, the person never sought medical attention. The bone was never removed. They just got better. But what they didn't know was that the bone was now embedded in the bony matrix of their rib. And as they lived over the next 20 or 30 years, the bone matrix grew around the bullet and incorporated the bullet into their rib, all right? And you can quite clearly see it. The bullet has been integrated into the rib and the individual died uh, and then donated their body to science. And then scientists opened up their body to find this bullet as now part of the individual's skeleton. Here is a pretty interesting and uh, frankly, fairly common set of anti-mortem uh, anti insult to the bone. And this is a type of anti, this is a pattern of anti-mortem trauma called a perifracture. And a perifractures are commonly found in the ulnas. So it's this bone right here. And it is a, it is the result of multiple defensive wounds because when you are struck towards the head or towards the upper body, the natural human instinct is to bring up the arms so that the blow will fall on your lower arm. Specifically, it will fall, fall on your ulna. 
and the blow will strike the ulna and it will basically cause a pattern of fractures. And when those fractures heal, even though there could only be hairline fractures, it will heal as a slight knot over that part of the bone. So the result is, is that perifractures are these healed longitudinal cracks in the ulna uh, caused by these, these sort of defensive gestures. Perifractures reoccur. You generally find not one or two, but you can sometimes find a pattern of perifractures, 15, 16, 20 different perifractures. Um, in fact, so many perifractures that you, you can't even count them on these individuals' ulnas. And if you look at that photograph at the top, uh, at the bottom is a healthy, uninjured ulna, uh, but right up above it is a ulna that has been really, really heavily battered. Uh, it's, that person used that ulna in defense many, many times, and it's given his ulna this kind of naughty, kind of twisted look to it. In fact, it shortened his, his ulna. And in fact, if you look at these collection of ulnas on the lower left, those are a collection of ulnas that were excavated from a gladiator's graveyard outside of the Greek, uh, Roman city of Ephesus. And uh, Ephesus was kind of a retirement home for, for Roman gladiators. And when these individuals were, were excavated, one of the things it discovered was that their ulnas were just, just completely torn up and all twisted and knotted uh, because, of course, they were Roman gladiators. They'd been using their arms defensively their entire lifetimes. Uh, perifractures tend to reoccur in individuals that lead very violent lives, like Roman gladiators. Um, you know, they, they occur, this is a very sad thing to report, but they occur in women who are in long-term abusive relationships. Also, skaters, uh, for very predictable reasons. Uh, skaters fall on their face, bring their arms up to, to shield their face. So a lot of professional skaters tend to have these really naughty ulnas. So, you know, and it is a defensive wound, even though they're just defending themselves against pavement. Now, let's move on to perimortem trauma. Perimortem trauma is trauma that occurs just at the moment of death or just after or before uh, the moment of death. So the bones break, and this is, this is a wet break that is unhealed, all right? Like these x-rays in this individual who had a very bad morning. Here is a cranium that was excavated uh, from Chama, New Mexico. And uh, if you're studying ancestry, you'll note a number of uh, European ancestral traits on that skull. Uh, but of course, you're more likely to notice uh, the giant axe head sticking out of this person's head. Uh, now, the remains themselves dated to the late 17th century, and this corresponds to a particularly violent incident in New Mexican history uh, called the Pueblo Revolt, which took place in 1680. And in 1680, the, the Native Americans of the uh, Pueblo region rose up in revolt against the Spanish Empire. And this is an individual with European ancestry, so this is probably not a, a, a Native American. And if you study the face, you'll quite notice it's a biological male as well. So this is a would-be conquistador, probably from Spain, who met his end at the hand of one of the Native Americans of, of the Pueblo region. And if you study the breaks, notice that these are all fresh breaks. The breaks uh, that are on the bone are sharp. They are close together, so the bone was alive when it shattered. Uh, and there is absolutely no healing taking place with any of this insult. Also, if you notice the angle of the blade, uh, the individual was struck from behind at this angle, uh, and that is generally, uh, it's generally how left-handed people hold axes. So this would-be conquistador met his hands at the end of a Native American who was left-handed. Um, now, injuries, uh, especially perimortem trauma, uh, match specific instruments, and, and forensic anthropologists do this quite a bit. They attempt to look at bone trauma and see what kind of tool was used to cause this trauma. And this is done with experimentation with corpses. Forensic anthropologists will inflict trauma on either fresh, courses, uh, fresh corpses, people who donate their bodies to science, or uh, state-owned human remains, and they will basically assemble categories of insult to bone. This is what these type of guns will do to these bones. This is what these type of instruments will do. This is what these types of knives, this is what these agricultural tools will do. A forensic anthropologist has in his head 
a catalog of the horrible things that one person has done uh, to another. Uh, and in fact, I want you to look at this, these, uh, this skull right up above me, and you'll notice it has uh, two insults to it. And these are, of course, perimortem injuries because the injuries are sharp and, and uh, fresh and there's no heal to them. So we have a blow which took place right here, this sort of crescent-shaped insult right above uh, the left eye. No, right above the left eye. That was probably the first insult. The individual goes down, and then you'll notice a second blow occurred on the back of the head. So this individual was struck in the face. They then pitched forward, and then uh, you know the murderer then struck them on the back of the head. And again, I want you to look at the patterns of injury. The crescent-shaped depression, blunt force trauma, the crescent-shaped uh, blunt force trauma above the left eye, and then the circular trauma done to the back of the head. Now, this individual was found uh, in the conservatory, so we're going, to, we're going to use the clues to try and figure out which of these three instruments was used to cause that kind of insult to the bone. And I want you to look and imagine how, what kind of injuries each of these weapons, each of these tools would, would cause. We have a hammer, strike one, strike two, a candlestick, or a lead pipe. So what sort of individual, what sort of tool was used to dispatch this individual in the conservatory. We will call this Forensic Exercise A. Now pause the video if you have to, because I want you to sort of judge which instrument was used. The hammer, the candlestick, or the lead pipe. Now, knife cuts work the same way, uh, uh, more or less. That basically through experimentation on cadavers, but sometimes these, these pigs as well. Uh, anthropologists build up a catalog of different trauma marks on bone. And if you can see some of these trauma marks right up above me, uh, there is a common, this individual was disarticulated by a, a murderer, and you can quite easily see that they use two different tools, a knife and then uh, a saw. And, and this is quite common, that sometimes people will, dis, will disassemble bodies, disarticulate a set of human remains in an attempt to hide them and they'll use two different tools to do so. Generally a knife to get down to the bone and then something much heavier and more cutty to get through the bone. Um, and for instance, look at these bones right up above. You can tell the difference between the knife cuts and then the saw cuts. Um, and indeed, often the cuts used with saws, saws will generally not cut on the first go. They'll generally hop around a bit before they find purchase and can go through the bone. But one of the one of the more unusual things about saws is each saw has its own distinct pattern of cutting. It leaves a distinct cut pattern because of the way that the different teeth in the saw are arranged. And in fact, each individual saw in the world has almost its own pattern of cutting. So often a forensic scientist can find a set of human remains, study the, the, the the cut marks made on the bone, find a saw in a suspect's garage, use that saw on pig bones, and then attempt to match the patterns. So generally, in attempting to hide evidence of their murder, when they use their, the family saw to disarticulate a set of human remains, they often generate the evidence that will often be used to convict them. Now, uh, here is another archaeological, uh, archaeologically known uh, trauma. This is a, uh, a femur that was excavated from a, a churchyard uh, at, a, at a place called St. Saint Kirk in Aberdeen, Scotland. Uh, and it is the uh, interior of a femur. And you can see there's quite a big chunk taken out of the femur. Now, this cut was on the interior of the left femur, and it indicates a downward stroke by a right-handed individual. And the forensic anthropologist who was studying this trauma couldn't match it with anything modern. So they basically went into a museum, asked to borrow a number of medieval weapons, use those medieval weapons on pig bones, and were able to eventually determine the type of weapon that was used on this individual, even though this individual had died 500 years ago. And the answer is the cut marks match that sword right up above my head. That is a something called an arming sword. It is a 
heavy bladed chopping weapon from the 15th century. And that is a serious blow. So as you can see from the photograph, they even sort of got the angle of the blow. The individual was turned away from his killer and was basically stepping out away from them when the individual swung that chopping sword down, sliced through the flesh so hard it cut into the bone enough to cause that injury right there. That would have sliced right through the femoral artery uh, and it would have been a killing blow. Uh, even given modern medicine, it's unlikely the individual could have survived. So uh, don't turn your back on a heavily armed Scotsman. That's, that's the moral of the lesson. Now, uh, this type of study was quite successful in generating one of the key pieces of evidence used to convict Daniel Rowling, the Gainesville Ripper. Uh, the Gainesville Ripper uh, raped and killed five women in 1990. And uh, I'm not going to go into tremendous detail, but he killed them by basically stabbing them repeatedly in the back uh, using the his full force. I mean, he was driving the knife as hard as he could. And he was not just punching the knife through uh, the bodies, but he, he was actually pu pushing the knife through the rib cage. And famed forensic anthropologist William Maples was able to study the cut marks made on the ribs of these, uh, of these poor victims. And he was able to determine the length of the blade, the width of the blade, that it had a, a saw back on the back of the blade. And then he was able to think, well, where would a penniless drifter go to find a heavy stabbing knife? So he basically went into a series of pawn shops uh, around Gainesville, Florida, and found one of the things that you can find in these uh, pawn shops is a K-Bar knife. It's a, it's a Marine Corps fighting knife. He then purchased one, used that, used that weapon to create a series of, of trauma to bone, and it matched perfectly. And even though Daniel Rowling had thrown his murder weapon away, uh, William Maples was able to say, this is the weapon that was used, a Marine K-Bar knife. And then on, this, on the stand, William Maples was able to document the pattern of insult, the pattern of injuries that was done to these women. And as William Maples was giving his testimony, uh, Daniel Rowling like broke down in the courtroom and again, sobbing uncontrollably. And largely as a result of Dr. Maples' testimony, Daniel Rowling broke down uh, and confessed uh, to the murders. And I believe he was executed. Now, getting away from, you know, knives, uh, one of the most common ways in which individuals are murdered is, of course, through gunshots. And gunshots tend to leave very, very distinct patterns on sets of human remains. Gunshots tend to be distinct. You have an entrance wound and an exit wound sometimes. And uh, the thing about guns is that the exit wound is always large and irregular, but the entrance wound is always very small and regular. It almost perfectly matches uh, the bullet uh, that was used on the individual. And especially on craniums, it tends to leave this star-shaped pattern of cracks. So the bullet will impact the bone, fracture the bone, and then the, as the bullet is passing through uh, the human body, it will misshape, it will break apart. So when it exits, it, it's large and irregular. And you can see this on the uh, skull right up above me. The individual was shot in the forehead. That's the entrance wound. That's how you can tell the bullet went in this end. But then it exited out of the back lower back of that same skull. And you can see that the exit wound is large and irregular. And this is how you tell that the individual was shot from the front and not from behind. And uh, to determine the weapon that was used, you just measure the entrance wound, because of course measuring the exit wound is pointless. And you, you measure the size of the bullet hole, which should match the bullet rather accurately, uh, and determine uh, the millimeters or the caliber that was involved. And caliber, if you don't know, is the a decimalization of the English inch. So it basically a 38 caliber, uh, 38 caliber bullet is 0.38 uh, of an inch. And generally to confirm that this is in fact the firearm being used, forensic anthropologists will borrow uh, guns from a gun library and shoot pig carcasses. And what they're attempting to do is, is match to, uh, to duplicate the trauma that was done on the murder victim in order to determine uh, what was what weapon was used and if, if the suspect had access to that same type of firearm. 
here is exercise B of our series of small forensic exercises. This individual obviously has an entrance wound in the center of their forehead. So we're gonna measure that entrance wound and we determine that the entrance wound is 9.7 millimeters across. Or, and we're gonna convert that into freedom units, that is 0 0.38 inches. So, uh, I already gave you the answer, but oh well. Uh, so, using the powers of your own brain, uh, determine the bullet that was used uh, on this poor person. In addition, uh, bullets, or really projectiles of any kind, will generally, but not always, they will generally travel in a straight line. Uh, so you can tell where the bullet entered and where the bullet exited. Uh, hence the individual of the victim in relationship to the shooter. So if you've got a really good knowledge of human anatomy, you can also tell the path that the missile takes and what blood, what any major arteries or organs it might pass through. I mean, you know that the femoral artery is on the inside of the thigh. So when the Scotsman killed that guy uh, with the arming sword, you know that that's going to slice right through the femoral artery. Now, of course, you don't need a good knowledge anatomy to know that this wound was, of course, fatal. So let's actually look at this individual for a second. Uh, here is a cranium at the entrance wound is just above uh, the left eye. And the exit wound is at the back of the skull. So the individual was shot here, but the exit wound is here. So in other words, and it's always easier to move the victim instead of the shooter. Just assume the shooter is standing. So this individual, when they were killed, they were basically looking up at their murderer. So the individual was shot, the bullet entered here and exited here, all right? Now, this is the third of our series of little forensic exercises, exercise C. And as you can see in this individual, this person did not have a good day. They were shot in the head four times. And what I want you to do in this exercise is to rebuild the sequence of perimortem trauma. We have four distinct bullet holes, A, B, C, and D. And I want you to rebuild which came first, second, third, and fourth. And you're gonna do this using your knowledge of entrance and exit wounds, as well as logically moving the victim in relationship to the shooter. Now I want you to assume more or less that the shooter is being stationary and the victim is moving in response to the insult that's being inflicted upon his body. So uh, first entrance and exit wounds. Now we can quite easily tell the difference between entrance and exit wounds. And if you look there, you can see that that is clearly an exit wound. Uh, the injury to the skull is large and irregular. So that's where the bullet exited as it was already misshapen and probably broken up into two or three fragments. And what I've done with these dowels is what the scientist has done is slid the dowel through uh, the entrance and out the exit wound. And I've placed the letters on the sides of the entrance wound. So the A, that's, that's, that's the entrance wound. And I want you to rebuild it. Which one of these logically took place first? Which one of these logically took place second, third, and fourth? As the individual was shot repeatedly in the head and then moved in response uh, to these bullet wounds. And again, it's got to make sense in your brain. Which one of these logically would have been first? I will give you a hint. It was neither A nor B. Both of those bullet wounds came from this side. So either your victim leaped 10 feet into the air before being shot, or they are already on the ground and the shooter is walking up to them and continuing to fire. But which was first? Now, multiple injuries can actually be sequenced through something called Pop's Rule. Uh, and Pop's Rule is when Later, later fractures from trauma will not cross fractures from earlier trauma. Uh, and if you study in these two blunt force traumas that have been inflicted on the skull right here, you can see that uh, one took place first. The hammer struck the back of the skull and created a fracture pattern. And then when the, when the pipe struck the front of the skull, it also created a fracture pattern. But those fractures stopped when they encountered these earlier fractures. So in other words, you could just look at the pattern of fractures and know that the individual was struck with the hammer first and then uh, with the lead pipe. And again, I want you to do another forensic exercise. This is a skull that was drawn for me by one of, uh, one of my former students. And she did this to show a pattern of Pop's rule in action. So here we have 
three traumatic injuries, A, B, and C. And I want you to study the fracture patterns. And you should be able to tell which one was first, which one was second, and which one was third. And do that very quickly while, um, while I drink my energy drink. Shouldn't be too hard. Now, here are the perimortem edges of a fatal gunshot injury. Uh, please note the sharp edges and the spalling present uh, on the insult to the bone. Now, this only happens with bones that are alive, with perimortem injuries. In an empty skull, or in a, a skull that has been dead for a long time, when it is inflicted uh, with trauma, it doesn't just break or fracture. It tends to shatter and dramatically fragment. Here is a skull in which, which suffered insult long after death. This is a post-mortem injury. This is post-mortem trauma. And post-mortem trauma leaves very, very different fracture patterns. These fractures are dry breaks as opposed to the wet breaks of living bone. And they are widely spaced. They tend to be radial. This has occurred long after the bone has died. A perimortem fracture will occur on wet bone like this. A post-mortem fracture will occur on dry bone, and it's like that. Because post-mortem trauma occurs long after the bone is dead, this re these result in dry breaks, and depending how much time has passed, uh, the break can often be very sharp with splinters and cracks running the length uh, of the bone. And again, compare these fractures. Uh, at the top, that is post-mortem trauma. Compare that to the bullet wound on the lower left. That is perimortem trauma. And again, look at the bone right up above me. That is post-mortem trauma. The break occurred when the bone was dead and it shattered quite dramatically. In other words, you can tell the difference between injuries that occur, fracture patterns on bones that occurred when the bone was alive and then when the bone uh, was quite dead. Now, uh, unfortunately, the most common post-mortem trauma is caused by animals. Uh, generally, you know, carnivorous rodents, rats, uh, rodents uh, cause very distinct set of insults to bones. Uh, rats will gnaw at the epiphyses and they'll give these bones a very worried like look. If you look at these bones right up above me, the rats have been at those bones and they've chewed away the epiphyses of the bones, the ends of the bones, giving them this kind of fractured, almost feathered like uh, look. And some animals will actually carry away body parts. If you remember back to the Ruxton case, they didn't find all of the bodies. You know, those might have been carried away by animals. Especially canines. Dogs, coyotes, wolves even, will often just tear away part of a, a, an unattended human body and just carry it away. And who knows where it goes. So anyway, larger, larger carnivores, especially canines, will often carry away, carry away body parts to their dens. And if you can see uh, from these three bones right up above me, this is a photograph of three human bones that were found in a coyote den close to downtown Los Angeles. And they have no idea who, who these bones belong to. Um, no, the one in the middle is human. Only the one in the middle is human. And remains in wilderness areas. And this sadly happens all the time. Someone will go hiking, get lost. A freak thunderstorm or snowstorm will, will brew up and they die on the mountainside long, you know, long from where they're supposed to be, far away from where they're supposed to be. And the animals will find the body before park rangers do. Uh, and they, won't, they will rarely not find the entire set of human remains uh, because canines, coyotes sometimes, will carry them away. One of the other weird oddities of human bones, and this happens, you know, in the South all the time, is that animals will avoid the bodies of humans who are habitual users of hard drugs, all right? Uh, people who use heroin, people who use heavy use of opiates, people who use methamphetamines, they generally carry traces of these heavy drugs in their system. And when they die unattended in the deep woods, their bodies are so poisoned, animals will not eat them unless the animal is like in really dire straits. And here we have a set of human remains and this individual died far, far back in the woods. And if I remember correctly, this individual 
uh, had gone back to cook meth in a shack, like deep, deep in the forest. Uh, the meth lab explodes, but nobody like knows where they were. So the set, the, the human remains were unattended for years and none of the animals in that forest ate the body or, or they only took very small nibbles. And you can see, even though the body was unattended for years in the forest, there's almost no animal marks on this individual. The, the habitual users of heavy drugs, they have so many toxins in their systems that not even animals want anything to do with them. Don't do drugs. Now, from, these, from the knowledge I've just given you, you should have a pretty decent idea of anti-mortem trauma, of perimortem trauma, of post-mortem trauma, of what animals do, what weapons get used on a set of human remains. And we're going to put all of these skills together in a large case study in which you're going to analyze a group of individuals who died a very long time ago and they died pretty horribly. And you are going to reconstruct the pattern of what happened in this large case of Crow Creek. And I will see you there.